I found this equilibrium, I've lost a lot of friends. And so besides, you know, losing my mom and almost um, losing my own life, we've lost a number of friends to suicide. And it drives me crazy because there is so much taboo out there. People uh, feel guilty for needing the medication. They feel like it's a cop-out. They feel like uh, it's a failure of their willpower. It's a failure of character. And that perception is like poison to people that really, really need that assistance. Hey, everyone. So if you're not new to this channel, you probably are aware that I am on a journey to explore various subjects and to see where some positive impact can be made. But part of that journey led me to understand that it's also sometimes just important to honestly and openly talk about uh, various issues or subjects which often have a lot of myths around them. So to kind of add not only a questioning mind to it, but also just an honest sharing, which I feel we miss too often. A, a, a dominating thought lately in my mind is that too many times we share only what's best in our lives. You know, that's kind of the, the way of the social media. We're uh, showing, you know, where we traveled and we have bought something new and we're happy with our partner. And that kind of creates this illusion that every, for us, that everyone is living great and we're the only ones having trouble. And it's not real. Everyone is having difficulties, but people are good at hiding it. But that does a disservice because we start to feel like everyone is fine and I'm the only one having a difficult time. Thing is, we all go through trouble. But whenever I meet a, an honest person who is not only capable of openly talking about various issues, but also about uh, sharing their both uh, ups and downs, uh, but even more importantly, not only sharing the difficulties they have, but also how they overcame them. And that's why I feel this podcast is so special because in this episode, I'm joined by Salma Thornton, who we talked uh, together with about the science behind yoga. And we did touch the subject of depression for a little bit there, but that inspired me to make this dedicated episode where uh, Salma shared very openly about her own experience, how she went through depression and uh, how she met, he, she learned to balance it and to, to live with it. And she basically, over the way I see it, she overcame it. And what strikes me very much as well is uh, in, in her story, as you will see, she shares that in the past, uh, when she was much younger, she used to uh, judge people lean to judge people who are having a depression and I know I was in that stage years ago as well it's it's kind of the easy way to look at depression and to think oh these people you know they're they're weak willed and and you know they they choose to be unhappy and and she had their perspective years ago I had their perspective and she learned as again you'll see through this video she learned the hard way that it's not about willpower. There's a lot of myths around what is depression and it's much more serious and much more important to understand what it is than most people think. And that's why, again, I felt inspired to talk to Salome, a very rare individual where, you know, such honesty, such clarity and the way she expresses her thoughts. And also she is a science-based person. She likes facts as much as I do. This is again where, where we have a good talk to each other. And uh, so it's not just her personal opinion, but, uh, but it's also an educated opinion, not only from her own experience, but also from her generally collected knowledge. So, you know, I'm, I guess I'm talking a bit here too long, but I just wanted to say it's a very special talk. Uh, I hope that this will uh, open up the eyes of many people to what uh, depression actually is. I hope that whoever is having a difficulty with depression that this help will be this talk will be supportive and will be valuable and yeah I just hope you will enjoy the talk as much as I did so without further ado I let you listen to the talk and have a good one but we, we already know each other but what struck me most was you, you mentioned that phrase wearing your heart on your sleeve 
Mm-hmm. And I heard that phrase somewhere in, in the past, but never clicked with me that much. But when you said it, I realized, oh, actually, we're, we're two like that. We're, the two of us together are like that. And uh, during the talk, you brought up the um, subject of depression, mm-hmm. which is a, a big subject on my mind, which I don't know enough about, I feel. And I find it so rare to find people who would be so open to talk about it as much as you are. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to come back together and look at that subject a bit more. Okay. So, so that's, that's the intro. You want to, uh, do you want to chip in something as well? Um, I, I was going to ask, have you, do you suffer from any sort of depression? You know, the thing is, I don't think so. Not that I ever known. Uh, I there's one moment in my life when I was in my teens. I was 17, 18, the last couple of years of school, and I was in a very low mood. Uh, so I, I had insomnia. Basically, I, I could barely sleep, and I kind of distanced myself from my friends, and I was very moody. But that primarily was because I was pushed to study, and I didn't know what. It's kind of a common dilemma in my country. Uh, long story short, uh, so a couple of years I was in that down mood, but then eventually I changed up my life and it was all good. So I, I do like to say I was kind of depressed, but that's even, even there I'm cautious because that's where I feel like I have a lack of knowledge. Because I think we spoke, you and me spoke about that too, uh, the last time is that, uh, sometimes people have misconceptions about what depression is. And I think, you know, there's a danger even in my mindset like some people are like, oh, it's, they think it's just a a choice or it's just a moody person, but it's so much more than that, as far as I know. And uh, but the very last thing I wanted to say before I get back uh, is that yeah, so that kind of that's one more reason why I'm interested to to learn about it is because it's more difficult for me to relate because I don't think I really went through that, but I see that it's such a big thing and and no one is safe from it. I mean, anyone, anyone can have it any time from as far as I can see. So yeah, mm-hmm. my mind is very curious about all of it. Um, I used to be one of those people that used to think it was kind of a choice. Um, when I was a teenager, my parents were both, um, both of my parents suffered from depression mm. or my mom suffered from depression and I actually lost my mom to that. Um, mm. But when I was a teenager, they were both also self-medicating quite a bit. And so they were drinking and doing other things. And so I didn't really have the support I needed in order to try and go to school or try and, um, you know, work on myself and becoming the best person that I could be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my energy sort of went into just trying to stay on the path moving forward. Um, And a good, um, the mom of one of my good friends, she kind of took me under her wing and I stayed with her for a little bit and she started taking me to these Al-Anon meetings. And I personally, I don't have much patience for, um, like I don't have very much patience for whining or Mm -hmm. sort of pity parties or, and part of that I think has to do with the fact that, you know, I watched my parents growing up go through bouts of depression and then also self-destructive behavior with addiction. Mm. And I always kind of swore that I was not going to fall into this same trap. And everywhere on the walls, it said, um, misery is a choice. Misery is a choice. And I found it so sort of um, unpleasant to sit there and listening to everybody's horrendous depressing life stories Mm. Um, and if you don't know what Al-Anon is it's like I was about to ask you (laughs) yeah so Al-Anon is like um, for people who are family members or close to somebody that's an alcoholic or Mm. you know addict in some sorts Um, and so those relationships often become very codependent in a way where the person that's not an addict um, kind of allows the addict to have all these mood swings up and down um they kind of break your boundaries so a lot of their issues wind up sort of becoming your issues it's it's tricky to explain um but so it can be very hard for people that are 
family members or close to somebody that suffers from addiction because mm -hmm. they're self-destructing right in front of your eyes and you love them and you care about them, but they're also oftentimes not very nice to you. Um, and, and that's, you know, anyway, I went to that meeting and everybody goes up and they tell their story. And like I said, I don't have much patience for, you know, people complaining. I'm one of those people that thinks that you need to just get up and, you know, buckle up and go do it. And so mm. that was me for a time period where I would sort of just refuse to allow myself to have uh, those sort of depressed emotions and force myself through. Mm. Um, but I was in a way oftentimes finding other things to substitute. Like I would have these like serial monogamous relationships and um, imagine that, you know, I was falling crazy in love and everything was going to be wonderful because now I was in love. But then a few months in that kind of would wear off. And um, I realized, you know, maybe I wasn't really in love with that person. Mm. And it got to a point where I'd gone through that cycle so many times that I was starting to think that there was something wrong with me. And I mm. was just not really capable of loving anybody that way. Now I look back at it and I realize I was sort of using that sense of initial um, excitement and euphoria mm -hmm. as something to help pick myself up, but mm -hmm. it only lasted so long and then it would drop and I'd get depressed again. And, you know, um, and then I met Matt and mm -hmm. with him, the feeling of love never went away. Like I was truly madly in love with him, mm -hmm. but the cycle didn't stop. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it was, my mom died in 2006 and she committed suicide. Um, and I moved to, to America 10 days later to live with Matt and I, like, I refused to cry at my mother's funeral. I refused to participate in all of the wallowing and, um, grief, basically. I just shut down. Like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to participate in this. I'm not going to be weak. And my parents were very different in a way where my mom had a big temper and lots of emotions and all over the place. And my dad was much more so of a, you know, don't be weak, stop the whining, you know, very sort of, um, you know, closed off from that emotional contact. Mm. And from my perspective at the time, it seemed a lot easier to sort of mimic his behavior than to go through all of these ups and downs that I was watching my mom go through. Um, and so I tended to kind of try and like shut everything out. And then on my 21st birthday, after I moved here, about two months or three months after my mom died, um, it was like the floodgates just broke. Like I couldn't hold it anymore. And I just cried all day endlessly. Uh, and it was kind of at that point where I feel like my sort of PTSD from growing up in a challenging environment like that, um, especially through my teenage years, sort of kicked in. Mm. And a very big part of it, I think, was a fear of abandonment and sort of an attachment disorder because I also didn't really bond well with my mom as a baby. I bonded to my grandmother. Um, and Matt was still in, you know, he was still sort of disconnecting from his previous marriage. And... Um, so, you know, he would have to go and see his boys kind of separately from me in the beginning and was dealing with, you know, all that other stuff. And I remember every time where he would leave, I would start to panic and I would mm. sort of start to spiral and like not be able to breathe and all these things. And I didn't know what was happening because I'd never experienced that before. I had for such a long time just like, had my horse blinds on and I'm not going to get pulled off balance. Um, so I really had no idea of like who this person was that all of a sudden was just crying all the time. And, um, and I'd get these bursts, outbursts of anger. Um, and I think I mentioned last time 
that I, I developed a fondness for uh, Mary Jane or marijuana. Mm. And part of that was because it allowed me to sort of quell down that reaction, that sort of mm. physical, emotional reaction. And what happens when you have that big physical, emotional reaction is for one, like your heart beats, goes up, you have a hard time breathing. So it definitely is very physical, but it also makes your mind to just start spiraling. Mm. And the mind in a way always wants to have a reason for things. And it's really good at your, it's really good at telling itself these stories or excuses for why something is the way that it is. And I would have these angry outbursts where I'd want to like push Matt away. I would want to fight or I'd want to run away myself. And then I would smoke a little bit and it would sort of help me calm down. And then I was able to go back and sort of think what, what, what just happened? Like, what was it that just happened? Why am I so angry? And it would often start off with, I would be, you know, I would blame Matt for the anger or blame my husband for the anger. I'd be like, he did this and that's why I'm so mad. Yeah. But then, you know, as I started to go back, I'd be, hang on, that's not really a reason for, you know, you to be so mad. And then I'd go a little step further back and I'd realize, what was it that first triggered the emotion? And usually it came down to fear. And mm. so it was a sense of uh, vulnerability or anxiety of being sort of left behind. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, and so that really allowed me to start, you know, healing myself in a way, was to realize that the story that you tell yourself to excuse your behavior isn't necessarily always true. Mm. Um, and so I started to get better. Like my breakouts happened less and less. Like instead of being every day, I started to go like twice a week. And then it was like maybe once a month, once every two months. But at the time, I was also still self-medicating. I would drink. Um, I can hear this little child hanging on the door. Uh, and, you know, I, my parents were both addicts. And in Iceland, there's kind of a funny routine of where you work five days a week. And you mm. just work really hard those five days a week. And in the evening, you might go, you know, have a cup of tea or something with your friends or, you know, hang out with your, I would hang out with my grandmother. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Sweet, baby Jesus. Um, <laughs> there's the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so. Uh, we, if you want, we can wait until he leaves. Have a clear room okay. Pause it. No. Hello, no, Matt. That, that lock is not very effective, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> not at all. Um, so where was I? Um, start to backtrack the story. Oh, I, can, I can backtrack with you. Uh, you were mentioning tea with your grandmother? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So in Iceland, the tradition is kind of like, you don't really drink during the week. We work really hard. But then when the weekend comes, it's like everybody binge drinks and yeah. you just, you go to the bars and you drink, 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 and you're at the bars until like 6 a.m. in the morning and then you start wandering home. And because of that structure and how that um, like social framework was, that's how, you know, that kind of kept me on just that same role as all of my friends. But I've realized over the years that as soon as you remove a limitation and going past that original line becomes the new norm, it is very hard to bring the limitation back, at least for myself or for people that have sort of addictive tendencies. Um, and when I moved here, American society is a lot different. Like they drink mm. on a daily basis. They drink sometimes like with their brunch or, you know, things like that. Mm. And as soon as I started adapting to that, my um, sense of like control and self-discipline started to really uh, suffer. And 
you know, when I first moved here, I didn't really have anybody here. I just had my husband. Um, and then we had our first daughter, Annika. And it was during that time frame where I really started to go down. Mm. Um, my like OCD was really ramped up. Like I would be cleaning, cleaning, cleaning all the time, trying to make everything perfect all the time, which in a way is just a way for somebody to try and exert control and feel mm. like they have control over something. Um, but it got to a point where, you know, I would go for a walk in the afternoon and then around time that I was making dinner, I'd open a bottle of wine and I'd drink like a whole bottle of wine in the course of the evening. Mm. And, you know, that would alleviate some of my own emotional discomfort. Mm. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, if I drank too much, I would then have some sort of emotional outburst. If, I, if anything came up or I felt vulnerable, I felt hurt or something, I would lash out. Um, and I started waking up as well every morning feeling unbelievably depressed to the point where I didn't want to be alive. I mm. had a very sort of um, skewed perspective of my relationship with my husband. Um, and that's when I started going to seek out help. Um, and I, you know, I started off at first, went to go see my counselor. She put me on a medication and that it was very strange the first time I tried medication and I wasn't, I was very resistant to doing it because of watching my parents go through that self-destructive cycle, even with the medication. Mm. But, you know, but the thing is that when you have a mental disorder, if you have an addictive nature, if you suffer from depression, anxiety, you have to be extremely careful. Like you have to, accept the you know accept the reality that you can't really mess around with your brain chemicals and mm -hmm. alcohol and other drugs they affect your you know serotonin and dopamine like they cause these false releases of serotonin or you know unnaturally stimulated mm -hmm. and what that does is over time it makes your brain less and less capable of releasing those chemicals itself anyway i started um taking the medicine and it was very strange at first because it was like going from this sort of haze where everything was just you know unbearable in a way where life was really dark um where i didn't really see a point to the future or anything like i was just kind of holding on by a thread for my daughter um and as I started taking the medicine, it was kind of like I got pulled back from that state of mind. And my sense of um, self-esteem, my sense of self-reliance, my sense of like knowing who I was sort of started to uh, stabilize. Mm. And so I did that for... I think about six months and then I felt like I was, you know, I had my feedback underneath me and I was capable of um, trying to go without the medicine. I also had some side effects from the medicine that I um, didn't care for, which was why I came off of it. It would make me feel really, um, they call it locking in. It's where you can't break your own attention. Like you just, I would, my daughter would be trying to talk to me. She'd be like, mom, mom. And I'd be like stuck and not able to switch my attention, even though mm. I knew she was there and waiting for me. Mm. Um, and that was very uncomfortable. And so then I came off of that medicine and I tried really hard to maintain the perspective that I had on the medication as I came off of the medication. So meaning like the way that I felt, the sense of sort of lightness that it had given me, the sense of equilibrium. Um, I tried to maintain that. And as I came off it, I went off of it slowly, like, you know, responsibly, under supervision of a doctor. And I was able to maintain that for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and everything was fine up until um, after Una's birth. So that's about three years that I was able to be off of medication. And 
so we had Una and everything was fine. And then kind of during or shortly after she was born and also especially during the time that I was weaning her, she was no longer breastfeeding. And so just so that you know, and anybody that's watching this knows, when you breastfeed, it helps your body release uh, oxytocin, which is very mm. relaxing, but also a pleasurable brain chemical. Mm. So breastfeeding always sort of helped me um, mm. sort of stay lifted. And so when I would stop, um, the depression would kind of come back with a vengeance. Mm. And I remember sitting on the back deck and like the girls would approach me and I'd get really irritated by like sound and stimulation. Um, and I would react in a way to, you know, people approaching me or noise and so on in a way that was um, unnecessarily sort of hostile or aggravated in a way. Um, and I remember I went and I was sitting on the back deck and I tend to really love being outside. I love nature. I love watching the trees. I love like hearing the wind rustling them um and so i've always been able to draw a lot of um like joy and calm from being in nature mm -hmm. and so i would go and i would sit on the back deck and i would try very hard to feel that sense of um joy i would try and seek out the positive emotions i would try my hardest to make them there and i realized no matter how hard i tried i couldn't i couldn't um get there like i just i could not feel any positive emotions they were just not available to me and so at that point i went back uh to my counselor i'd been in talk therapy that whole time but and decided to go back on medicine um and i got the same medicine again and um it was fine for a period of time. And then at a certain point, um, you know, the side effects started to come back where I'd get sort of keyed in and locked in and unable to break my attention. Um, and then, you know, I found that uncomfortable. And so I weaned myself back off of it and again, tried to sort of maintain that equilibrium. Um, and that worked pretty good for a while. But then it started happening again. And oftentimes, like, I wouldn't really notice my sense of, like, joy and happy chemicals going down until it was at the point where I was waking up in the morning. And as soon as I woke up, I would just, like, get a panic attack and start crying. And, you know, it was, you know, a very sort of unpleasant experience. And so then I went back on the medication. And I was on it for a while until we decided that we wanted to have another baby, which was Arky. And it took us actually two years to get pregnant with him. So for those whole two years, I was off of medication and I was able to sort of um, maintain to some degree that equilibrium. But then probably happened before I was pregnant with him, but his pregnancy was extremely hard on me. Um, not just physically, but more so mentally, because I didn't want to be medicated with a baby in my belly. Like I didn't want to be putting anything into my system that could, you know, harm him in any sort of a way. And so, um, you know, I wasn't, but then about, I want to say two trimesters in, so about six months into it, I was, you know, waking up every day, not wanting to be alive, waking up, just wanting to not feel like the excruciating, um, it's very hard to explain, explain, but like the pressure of your emotions makes it so you would all almost rather not exist than have to feel that sort of yeah. debilitating weight of misery. Like it's very hard to put words to it. Um, and so at that point, Matt took me back to my counselor and, you know, we spoke to her and she told me that, you know, it was very obvious that I needed to go back on medication. And because I was pregnant, she changed the medication I was on to one that was like supposed to be better. Um, and again, I had that experience of being 
like in this zone where everything feels like overwhelming and um, like the world is almost coming to an end. It's caving in on you and you just can't tolerate it anymore. But then as the medication started to work, I would get sort of pulled out of that. And it's very strange to all of a sudden go from waking up every day wanting to die to all of a sudden being like a normal person that mm. wakes up and does normal people stuff like make your kids mm. breakfast and go to work <laughs> mm. and um it was just such a relief but then i remember it was a really hard decision for me to decide to go on the medication while i was pregnant but we kind of weighed the um cost benefit analysis of which is going to be worse for the baby the endless stress chemicals and misery that is floating around mm. in your body or you know getting the medication so that you have a better chance of survival because that again i was kind of only holding on by a thread because of my kids because i didn't want to put them through what i went through um and i went i remember we got the prescription and we went to the pharmacy and I tried to hide the fact that I was pregnant because I was ashamed of having to need to go on the medication. And the pharmacist goes and she says, you know, medications like this are not really very good for depression. You should try yoga and going for long walks. And I remember like my sense of absolute like shame and the, the sense of like, oh my God, I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. Like I'm making the wrong decision. I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> and I came out and I told Matt and he was, he was so furious <laughs> counselor because yeah, sure. I was, you know, when you have somebody that's has strong, like suicidal tendencies, I have attempted suicide more than once. And I have come very close once where, you know, it's kind of amazing that I actually made it through. Um, and that, that um, experience kind of made that when I first tried that suicide and almost lost it, that was when I decided to stop drinking. Mm. And that was before this pregnancy. So I hadn't been drinking or doing anything bad for, you know, or anything, you know, naughty habits, negative habits for about two years before that pregnancy and um, that sort of emotional breakdown. Um, and because I wasn't doing any of those self-medicating things, I was able to maintain a better equilibrium for a longer period of time, but I still was not able to do it on my own. And it was kind of at that point when I was doing everything correct. I was like tra trying to sleep on a consistent schedule and eat everything healthy and drink lots of water and w had no negative habits. Mm. Um, it was at that point that I kind of realized that this isn't a matter of willpower because my perspective up until that point was kind of like, don't be a pussy, get up and just, you know, make it through somehow. Mm but that it was a matter of, you know, a chemical imbalance in my brain. Um, and so I'm still on the same medication that I got during that pregnancy. And again, I had that experience of sort of getting pulled out of the dark and the light sort of all of a sudden, you know, coming in. And I've been doing, you know, well myself since then. Um, and I like the medication that I'm on. I don't really have any side effects. Um, I feel very stable. I feel like a normal person and it's a huge relief to be able to, you know, get up every day and do something productive and enjoy like your, the natural beauty and your children and your relationships. And like, it's for me for, and from my perspective, that's like an amazing gift. But since, you know, I found this equilibrium, I've lost a lot of friends. And so besides, you know, losing my mom and almost um, losing my own life, we've lost a number of friends to suicide. And it drives me crazy because there is so much taboo out there. People uh, 
feel guilty for needing the medication. They feel like it's a cop out. They feel like uh, it's a failure of their willpower. It's a failure of character. And that perception is like poison to people that really, really need that assistance. And I'm not saying that there isn't a ton of, you know, millennials out there or, you know, like the storyline kind of goes like are abusing these medications and, um, you know, taking them because they just don't feel very well for a little bit and it's messing them up. And that's, I'm sure that's true for some people, but for a lot of people, that's not true. And for those people that that is not true, the sense of shame that comes along with having to get a help from an outside source can kill them. And somebody that wakes up every day, for example, in my shoes, and feels miserable and didn't want to be there anymore, yet I look around me and I see I have a man that I love and that loves me, and I have healthy children that need me. I have a nice house and a beautiful garden. I have everything that I could ever want to be happy, to be that I should be grateful for. And, but at the same time, I can't feel those emotions. And there is a sense of shame and guilt that you carry within yourself for not being able to feel the gratitude that you're supposed to feel because of all of the things that you have around you, because of your fortune. Um, and so the exterior pressure, if you put that on top of it, on top of already knowing that you're broken in this way, it prevents people from seeking help. And so we've had a few people that have died. And like I mentioned, Carl, in the last video, um, he's one of, I want to say three or four now that have died in the last few years from suicide. Um, he would call me. And he would say things like, I don't want to do this because I don't want you to have to go through it again like you went through your mom. And I would do my very darndest to try and express to him, like, listen, you have to, one, get help. You have to find someone to talk to. You probably need to go on medication. And you have to stop drinking. Like, you have to stop the self-medication self-medicating because if you don't stop that and you just take the medicine on top of it it's not going to like help you get the balance that you need and so you know people that struggle with this they tend to self-medicate at first and then that becomes like this crutch habit and the con the idea of going without that crutch can seem like um, it can just seem in, like like it's gonna be almost impossible. Like, how are you gonna make it through? Um, and so, you know, when I decided that I was gonna stop drinking, it wasn't so much the not drinking that was a problem. It was the apprehension of what life was gonna be like without my crutch, without my, um, you know, self medication. And so I kind of realized I know my own brain and my own thinking process fairly well. And all or nothing concepts for me can sort of um, make the problem worse. Like if I, if I don't want to eat sugar, then I say, okay, Monday I'm going to stop eating sugar. And then I'll like binge on sugar up until Monday. Whereas if I say, oh, okay, you can have sugar, but just, you know, try to focus on eating protein and vegetables. I function much better that way, but the tendency tends to be to go for that all or nothing. And when it came to self-medication, I knew that I kind of had to do the all or nothing because I wasn't able to maintain a um, sort of detached, easygoing relationship with that. And... Um, so I kind of tricked myself by making a bet with uh, Travis and a few other people that it was going to be three months, no drinking. And at the end of those three months, I was allowed to start drinking again if I wanted to. But I knew deep down that once I got to that three-month point, I wouldn't want to go back. 
And I remember Travis was like, well, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Why don't you just quit if you want to quit? And I was like, well, because that, the, the concept of just quitting, going cold turkey, was um, slightly overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that, it worked for me. And I would, like, people sometimes wonder that drinking around me is going to, you know, bother me or something, but it doesn't. I don't care. And the reason why I don't care is because I realize the incredibly huge improvement in my life being without it. Um, And I've regained a sense of childlike joy and simple things like, you know, playing with my kids or doing some arts and crafts or gardening. Like, it's a lot easier for me to access the appreciation for life without needing, you know, a crutch to help me like feel happy. But um, I suppose like my, my frustration lies in the social narrative and pressure that people feel um, over mental illness, over not being able to, you know, be that happy forward going person without assistance. And I just think that one of the reasons why I'm so open about talking about this is because I know there's lots of other people out there like me. Mm -hmm. And I know there's lots of people out there like me that have that feeling of just pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do it. You have to keep going. It's a matter of willpower. You must be in control. And, you know, you can make it so far on that. But um, a lot of times that's just not enough. And I think it's dangerous when people add a sense of shame on top of seeking out help because there is a lot of people out there that desperately need it and they won't go, you know, they won't go get the help they need. And it kills Mm. people. Like it literally kills people. So, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, you you pretty much said it, but one of the things which definitely stood out for me and really, I really caught, caught it when you mentioned it first time on uh, our last chat was you mentioned that you have that attitude of pushing through and willpower. And that's kind of how I am as well. Uh, and in the past I had that idea, I guess it's, it's a common idea a misconception about depression that, Oh, it's a choice and, and it's only weak people have it. Later, with the more I learned about it and, and the more reason I, I got in, in my brain, I started to realize it's, it's, not, it's not a correlation. They're, they're two separate things. And that's, that also made your story very powerful for me to hear a very specific example of your story where you had that attitude and you definitely have you know, the guts, the willpower and everything. You have all of that, but that doesn't mean depression is still out of the question i guess it's not out of the question for anyone and one of the reasons i wanted to talk about this on record is part of it is yes i'm interested myself to to better understand it in case uh, i get exposed to it more and more but the bigger reason is the same one that you said it talk about it because not everyone dares to talk about it and um, too many people either blame the people who do that or or as you mentioned yourself people afflicted to themselves like internally they blame themselves for that so i think it's so important and and one more thought that came to me is it also there's such a big difference it's so easy to judge people that haven't went through an experience like uh, I, I was never a very judgmental person but i can still see the difference years ago when i would be exposed to the subject of let's say divorce i would mm-hmm. have a very different perspective about it than right now when i'm actually past a divorce and i'm like now when somebody comes up and says, oh, they got divorced or starts, starts criticizing someone, I'm like, well, you know, you don't know the whole picture, you know, just don't go blaming the people so quickly because when you go through that experience, it makes you more wise and you understand that there's always more than just good, bad, or easy, difficult. And uh, I think it's, for me, it seems it's important to uh, kind of use that same approach to anything especially things like our health in terms of think whenever we have that thought of, Oh, this is just a make-believe. This is an illness of, 
weak people or even blaming ourselves to, to, to realize that we potentially don't know what it really is and we shouldn't just make that clear uh, conception. I, I mean, I used to be like you in that sense. So when I was like, you know, I would have mental breakdowns periodically. Like I had my first major mental breakdown when I was 17. And I think I've had a few, I kind of, I don't really, I don't dwell on the number of breakdowns that I've had, but I remember the first one at age of 17 and I really didn't um, understand what was happening to me. Uh, but I used to be like that. I would look at people that were suffering and I would think to myself, why can't they just power through it? Why can't they just make the decision that they're going to be have a happier life? And I think it's very normal. I mean, and I say this as well because I've raised, you know, at least one of Matt's kids through the teenage years. Mm. And because of mine and Matt's age difference, the age difference between, for example, me and Liam, his younger son from his previous marriage, is only 10 years. Mm. And he is also very mature and um, intellectual. But I first met him when he was about 10. <laughs> and he hated my guts in the beginning. He would make my life miserable. <laughs> but, um, you know, he warmed up to me over time. But I could see in him that he was developing the sense of idealism. Mm. So where he would find, you know, this is the right thing and this is the wrong thing. And there wasn't really all that gray zone in between. Yeah. And I could relate to it really well because it wasn't that long ago that I had gone through that same perspective mm -hmm. of being like watching people do stuff that I'm like, well, that's not going to help anything. So that's bad. Yeah. This is the right way to do it. Um, and I remember it was Leah who told me at the time, but that was actually uh, a very normative psychological development for teenagers and like young adults as they are separating themselves from their family and kind of starting to form their own um, ideas of reality and how they want to live their life. And um, so in my sort of idealist time frame. I was very much the same way where I was like, you just can't let misery get the best of you. Like you just, you can't do that. And I would watch people suffer and I wouldn't have much empathy for it. Even though at the time I was having my own ups and downs, they were just, I didn't really understand them at, you know, at the time. And like I told you before, I was masking a lot of my sort of, depression symptoms by having these like intensive like relationships where I thought you know everything was going to be wonderful and then as soon as that initial um sort of lust or you know relationship excitement wore off I'd be back to where my own baseline was which was you know significantly lower mm. this also affected me a lot for my education like I was had a very hard time going to school. I'm, I'm smart that I can study, you know, before a test and get a good grade, but my attendance would be horrible because I just couldn't bring myself to show up, to be there, to have people looking at me. And I would feel kind of see-through because on the inside, I'd be miserable and scared and um, like anxious and unhappy and feel like, uh, incapable and all these different things. And so being in a group, you know, in a space where there's tons of other people was oftentimes very sort of um, overwhelming and isolating. So despite the fact that you're surrounded by humans, you feel unbelievably alone. Um, and I struggled with this through my teenage years and my parents at the time being kind of sort of liberal hippies, uh, bohemian, hedonistic hippies, uh, they would send me to all these like naturopath doctors. And so I went to like the doctor that does like a foot pressure massage that's supposed to like help clear your organs or, you know, all this other stuff. I went to one that like looks at the iris in your eye and like tries to decipher everything that's wrong with you based off of um, 
I'm like, I got tears here. Roke, you're supposed to tell me this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that's my, that's part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and so I would go through to all these, and I did like acupuncture and all these different things to try and like change my diet. So I went through multiple different cycles of trying to improve my sense of being through all these like holistic um, exercises. And as we touched on, same with yoga. Like I tried to use yoga the same way and use meditation the same way to try and fix myself. But I never went to a counselor. I never, you know, and so a lot of times that's one of my sort of issues with, although I love nature and I love natural medicines and so on, but I think there is very much, um, there's quite a bit of danger in proposing that you can fix certain types of problems with things like homeopathy or pressure massage. And um, so to some degree, I think that kept me struggling significantly longer than I maybe needed to have been struggling. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess th there's two thoughts on my mind. And one of them is uh, I did notice that there is that new age tendency of people, I guess it's it's makes the situation again, yet again, worse when people not, let's say the first angle is where people just think that depression is a, a made up thing. Or another level is where people think that, oh, you can just don't go to the doctors, you know, go to all these mm -hmm alternative therapies and and kind of pushing people towards that direction i think that that sounds again unwise and i hope that some people who are listening to this conversation will realize that that's not a good suggestion and, and another thing which i wanted to also ask about you mentioned that denial uh, of those existing um symptoms mm -hmm. and uh, i was wondering so in terms of diagnosing uh depression where 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 does that usually begin? Or let's say a person, if we imagine it that this way, that a person is listening to this conversation and he's questioning, you know, am I depressed or should I go to see a doctor? Uh, where is that line where the person should? Or is, is it the case where if you have doubts, just go and see a counselor? Or what, what, what would you say? Um, well, there's different types of depression that people can suffer from, and it can be combined with other sort of mental illnesses, like um, you have unilateral depression, which is where people just kind of have the depression. Then you have bipolar depression where people go, so if you imagine here's the baseline, they go into depression, but they also go up sort of into, um, I forget the word for it now, mania, like bipolar, basically. Mm. Um, and then... I mean, my, I think that talk therapy is good for everyone, regardless of whether you have depression or not, because mm. I think most people, to some degree, have like internal conflict and baggage and damage. And a lot of times we need help unpacking it because the tendency tends to be to just squish it down there, pretend like it never happened and keep going. And when we do that, the side effect often is that it explodes out when you don't expect it. Like something, you know, sort of triggers a reaction from you. And then you have years of sort of, um, you know, backloaded suffering explode out. And so I think talk therapy is great. And I think that, you know, the concept of it being embarrassing to any sort of degree is, you know, ridiculous. As far as if you think that you are suffering from depression, I would say if, you know, if you have even the slightest, I, you know, suicidal thought, mm. it's time to go talk to someone. Mm. Um, and, you know, I had a multitude of suicidal thoughts for a long period of time before I went to go talk to someone. Um, and... It's not, it's not like something that you can fix overnight, but it is something that you can live with and have a good life. Mm. So get, de having depression or anxiety or being bipolar or, you know, any myriad of mental illnesses 
is not a, um, it's not like a necessary, necessarily something that has to cripple you or control your life. You can take the steps to improve your sense of well-being. And there's like one thing that I learned going through this process and being able to make it out of that state of mind, being able to make it sort of past those difficult times to where I am in my life now, where I have stability and, you know, joy and appreciation for all of the things that I have, is that things always change. Time doesn't stop. It keeps passing. And as time passes, things always change. And one of the dangers of you know, depression and things that I've, I, now I look back at my, you know, losing my mother. I wish that I had had the understanding back then to realize what she was going through and to help her hold on a little bit longer because she gave up, you know, when she was at the bottom but life doesn't have to stay at the bottom the whole time. You can bring it back up. And so I think that's a really important concept for people to think about is the fact that you might feel like there's no way out and that you'd be better off not existing anymore right now. But that doesn't mean that you're going to feel that way, you know, two weeks from now, if you go get help. Um, And, I think, you know, and for for me now, when I run into people that I think have similar struggles, that tends to be what I try and express to them. It's like, just hold on a little bit longer. If you can hold on a little bit longer, things will change. And especially if you, you know, have the courage and determination to make the changes that you have to make in order to get your life back. And you know, I think for a lot of people, that means that you have to kind of clean up your life a little bit. Um, and that can be daunting, for sure. But, you know, the same way as if you are a diabetic, you can't really eat tons of sugar all the time and you have to take insulin, okay? Because mm-hmm. otherwise, bad things are going to happen to you. And so the same thing if you have a mental illness or a mental disorder, you can't play around with you know drugs and alcohol and you have to take your medication and sort of accept the reality of you know maybe i'm gonna have to take this medication for the rest of my life and that's not a um a judgment or like a failure of my character that's my desire to you know take charge of my life and keep living and be present and enjoy it because for all I know, we only have the one Mm -hmm. and I don't want to waste it in misery. Mm. So did that answer your question? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, I I was, I was just about to comment that there were a number of questions that popped into my mind and you, as you spoke along, you answered a number of them. So, uh, but, uh, there's one, uh, minor one, which is still left on my list. And you mentioned that, your depression uh, kind of became more present after giving birth on uh, both occasions. The, I mean, your your two daughters. Uh, I also met and seen some cases where uh, there was depression after giving birth, and I was wondering whether is it a recurring thing that happens uh, once in a while, or is it just a coincidence? Uh, the connection between giving birth and depression in terms of the chemistry changing or something along those lines? So I'm going to preface this by saying I am not a neuroscientist, um, but from my experience and research, your sense of well-being is quite related to your hormones. And so, especially for women. um, And so, for example, estrogen is a sort of um, uplifting hormone. It can be more bring about more excitement to give you more energy. Whereas um, progesterone is a little more relaxing and calming. Um, And I've, I actually use birth control as an additional part to maintain my stability 
because I have very bad, um, like PMS or PMDD or something where for the week before I get my period, again, I would have become unbelievably depressed. Mm. So I am on a specific birth control to try and help me like minimize that change in hormones that makes the depression sort of drop. And like I told you earlier, when you're breastfeeding, you, um, your body releases uh, oxytocin, which is like a relaxing, happy chemical. And at the same time, your body, I forget, you know, because I, so I don't want to say anything that's not wrong, but your body maintains a sort of specific hormonal balance that doesn't fluctuate a lot. Like oftentimes you don't start to get your period until after you wean or until your baby's nursing significantly less. Um, but once you wean, those hormones start fluctuating again. And, you know, sometimes it takes them a little time to um, sort of even out. But I have every single time noticed a huge increase in my depression when I wean my kids. Mm. But at the same time, with, for example, Archimedes, I was unbelievably depressed during my pregnancy. I also, you know, had a lot of stress going on, but I was taking the best care of myself than, that I had, you know, in years. Um, so that's not to say that even though that is a likely occurrence and that's like the only time that it's going to pop up because some women become very depressed during their pregnancy. Some women become mm -hmm. very depressed right after birth or shortly after birth and during that time frame where you know, they might want to nurse their children. And oftentimes that leads to them not being able to nurse their children. And, mm -hmm. you know, for a young mother, that in and of itself can make them feel like a huge failure. So I think women definitely have a little extra bit of challenge on that front because of the constant fluctuations of hormones. Yeah. And, you know, there's like, you know, that stereotype concept of women being crazy, you kind of blame it on that cycle that's endlessly just woo, taking you all over the place. So, um, yeah. And I'll say another thing. I'm very open with my kids about this. Mm. Like my children know that my mom died. And when they were younger, they would ask me about her and I would sort of tell them, you know, I, I said that, you know, she died from sadness but then they observed me go through these cycles and mm -hmm. then they started to become concerned that I was going to die from sadness. Um, and so I explained to them and I'm very honest with them about things that, you know, when you have, you know, either addiction or a mental disorder or so on for one, these things are genetic. So you guys need to, be aware of that and be very careful about the decisions that you make in your life. I am very open with my kids about this because for one, I don't, I've always sort of thought that when it comes to children, I love kids and my favorite job that I ever had was working with kids. And that's always been sort of what I envisioned for my future. Um, and one of the things that I can't stand is people that sort of, talk down to children or dumb yeah, yeah. everything down for children because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the same <laughs> i mean i hate that <laughs> um and i don't ever want to lie to them so that they um you know in order to shelter them from life like i want to give them an accurate perspective of what's going on so that they can make informed decisions yeah. and yeah. You know, we, we, for example, don't teach our kids stranger danger. We teach our kids how to talk to strangers. And they have a mm. system for that. Because ultimately, eventually, they're going to have to communicate with strangers on occasion. Um, but so when it comes to depression and alcohol and drugs and all these kinds of things, I'm very open with them. And I, you know, I explain to them that my mom suffered from depression. And she um, was ma made a number of decisions that weren't helping her, that were making her worse. And it got to a point where she couldn't see the way out anymore. 
and she gave up. Um, but then I also expressly tell them, I am not doing that. I am making sure that I make very conscious decisions to maintain um, stability because I want to be alive. I want to be here with you. But then I also tell them these things are genetic and I take medication because I have a hard time, my brain has a hard time making these happy chemicals. And so I take a medication to help my brain make these happy chemicals. And I also explain to them, like, I'm not going to tell you what to do. When you're older, you will have to make these decisions for yourself. But these things are genetic. You know, alcoholism is genetic. Depression is genetic. Anxiety, like these are, there is a chance that one of my kids or more is going to suffer from the same illness. And I want them to understand that it's not something that's going to, it doesn't have to kill you. It doesn't have to defeat you, but you have to then be very responsible and not, not monkey around, not create bad habits. And I always tell them bad habits are easy to make, but hard to live with. Good habits are hard to create, but easy to live with. So just make good habits. <laughs> That's one more, uh, one more case where I, the question I wanted to ask you kind of answered in, in the way you talk, but just to, to make it even more precise and clear, uh, I, there's only a couple more questions that I have, but one of them is continuing from what you said, the advice that you would give to others uh, in, in these situations. And from what I gather from what you said, the one seems to be the educational side of it, I guess, mm -hmm. to prepare the individual to, to expect that it can be, it can happen, that it, it's not a bad thing per se, that there's nothing to be ashamed about and a continuation of that. And the other one that I picked up from you is uh, having a sense of holding on, mm -hmm. not giving up even when everything seems to be completely bad. So those, those are the two that I, uh heard from you and uh and they seem great uh, i think they sound terrific they sound like exactly what uh are the right things but is there anything else you would add or would you like to emphasize anything else in those two um yes yeah, so i'll add to the part of you know why another reason why you know self-medicating with you know alcohol and drugs is really dangerous is because when you're under the influence of other chemicals, it can um, like inhibit your sense of reason or logical thinking processes. And it can like, it sort of removes a lot of those filters. And um, that can often lead to rash decision-making. And so making the decision to sort of abstain from mind altering substances is, um, the reason for that is because that decreases the risk of making the mistake of giving up. Hmm. So um, that's kind of, you know, I realized for myself that I could maybe mask my emotions with self-medicating, but I was taking away my ability to um, recognize bad decisions in time if that makes sense. Um, and yeah, and the, another thing that is, I think, very hard is that if people are alone and they don't have anybody to help them, they don't, a lot, a lot, oftentimes you'll have people that do have people there to help them, but they won't accept the help. Mm. And I think that's, you know, very clear. For example, in Carl's case, I think Ella did everything that she could to keep him holding on but he wouldn't necessarily take the steps that he had to take in order to hold on for himself. And, you know, I've been able to take these steps and I'm very grateful for it. But if you don't have a sense of meaning, if you don't have a sense of purpose, then I think you have an extra challenge there. And I think I'm very, to some degree, fortunate in the sense that I lost my mother this way. 
because it made me very hyper aware of what I would be doing to my children if um, I made a selfish decision to just cut out. Right. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the things that I think people have to be really careful about, you know, sort of pushing that taboo willpower concept out there when it comes to mental illness. Um, and, you know, if you know anybody that struggles that way, it can mean, you know, the, it can, it can make or break whether they survive. If they have somebody there that's willing to, you know, pull them out of bed and drag them on a walk or, you know, help them go to see help by picking them up and not letting them, you know, bail out and taking them to the doctor. Um, that can really, you know, I think that can really make the difference of helping somebody survive or not, but it doesn't, it's not a guarantee. And so you can try your very best to be there for somebody, but ultimately they wind up having to, they have to want to make it through. So. That actually brought up uh, just one more question for me. And uh, I think it's, it's an important one to you again from, pretty much just continuing from what you said, it's advice for anyone who is uh, in contact with a close person or any person who mm -hmm. suffers from depression and how, what advice would you give for that person in terms of what to say, what not? I, I, obviously there's no you know, uh, cookie cutter answer for this, but any guidelines you would suggest for a person who you know, what to say, what not to say, or what to do, what not to do in, in that kind of direction? Uh, I mean, I hesitate a little bit there because I don't ever want anybody else to take the responsibility of losing someone they love to depression on themselves because it tends, I mean, that's not uncommon that if you lose somebody that yeah. you really love from depression, you turn on yourself or like, why didn't I do more? Why didn't I try harder? Um, and that's not, you know, it's not, that's not a good way to feel. Um, so, you know, if it doesn't work, it's not your fault. Like it's not the assistant's fault. And there is something to be said for having personal boundaries as well, because loving somebody or being close to somebody that does suffer mental illness can be incredibly draining and challenging on anybody that's close to them. Mm. And um, I think the kind of make or break it point there is whether the person that is depressed or suffering um, really wants to make it out, really wants to fix their life. Mm. Um, and I think that oftentimes, like I said before, has to do with meaning. Like how, if you can help them find a purpose if you can f help them uh, envision a life, you know, three months from now or two months from now after they try and clean their stuff up and, you know, go get help, take medication. Um, just trying to give them that little extra um, n nudge, like that little extra um, idea that, they, that life can't be better again that you can wake up and have joy and not just misery but at the same time it's important i think for the people that are the support system to not go down the ship mm -hmm. and um it's very i think it's very very hard to strike that balance and i think that's part of you know what went on with my mom and myself was like i didn't really truly understand the depth of her suffering at the time, but I was also trying to keep myself afloat. I was trying to um, be strong for my little brother and my little sister. And, you know, so now I look back and I can think of all the things that I wish I would have done. But at the time, I didn't have the knowledge that I have now. And so being angry with your like former self or blaming your former self isn't necessarily um, productive either um, in a way that almost just sort of 
takes one person that goes down and it's pulling the next person with them. So I'd say make sure that you know what you can do and how you can help, but you also have to understand like what is not your responsibility and that at a certain point you have to also take care of your own self in order to be able to take care of others. Um, but most of all, I just say, don't give up, keep calling them, keep knocking on the door, keep trying to drag them out for some exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, keep, you know, sending them resources that you think might help them. Um, talk to them about not being ashamed or not, uh, feeling like this is a failure of character, a failure of willpower, that it is in fact, you know, an illness that should be treated like an illness that should, you know, taking medication, you know, would you ever be ashamed of taking insulin if you were diabetic? Is mm. that somehow a failure of character? Is that somehow, you know, you not having the willpower to be able to eat all the sugar you want and not have blood sugar crashes? So um, I think that's what the conversation really needs to become about. And I'm, like I said before, I'm sure there's lots of people that do abuse medications, mm. but people have to make their own responsible uh, decisions. And so if people are going to take that sort of way out, that's their responsibility. But don't take other people, people's sort of abuse of the scenario and transfer that onto every other single person that's walking in those shoes because... Like you said before, if you haven't walked a mile in those shoes, you really have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. And um, it's very hard to imagine until you've been there. So, mm. yeah, it's, I mean, I, I struggle now in my current state of balance and happiness and, you know, with the support of medication and therapy, I struggle to sort of picture waking up tomorrow and feeling like I just want to die. But I know it's a possibility because I've woken up lots of times that way before. And, you know, sometimes people just don't want to wake up that way anymore. So they stop waking up. Yeah. But again, I think it's, to me, it seems so valuable to, to hear this, especially from you, since you have, uh, your own direct experience and to kind of be aware of it in, in a way which I feel how should, I imagine what should help to not panic when that happens, because there could be like that inner voice, that deeper voice, which says, as you said, this is going to pass. This is not, you know, this is not the end of the world, which I think if a person is not, is completely unaware of it. Uh, and I think what, what helps me, and as I said in the beginning, I, I don't think I ever had to, go for a really depressed state. But uh, one of the things which generally helps me with, with emotions, with my emotional kind of balance is an idea I picked up uh, that uh, emotions are, to a degree, are just emotions. Like if I feel, if there's sadness, it doesn't necessarily mean life is all bad and it's all crap. Like, like you said, things will pass. And I try to remind myself that at that moment uh, on the other hand, I notice a lot of people, they, they're so tied to their emotional state where they think if they feel bad, they so identify with it and they, they don't feel like there's, that's going to ever change. They kind of believe that you know, this, if, if, if I feel bad, that means everything is bad. And while you said, when you said yourself, it's not really the case. If I feel bad, it doesn't necessarily mean the world is <laughs> all bad. So I think hearing that and having that sunk sinking in somewhere sinking in somewhere in the back of the mind I, I imagine that could be a powerful tool yes and um i think like for i i <laughs> there was a time period where um i was very into like the four horsemen of atheism and mm -hmm. um there was sort of there were part part of something that they were talking about i forget which one it was was about um you know that your emotions are not necessarily a reflection of reality mm -hmm. and um like i've we've talked about a little bit before 
your brain is really good at creating a cause to explain whatever effect is going on. And um, when you're in a very sort of deep spiral of emotional and sort of mental agony, it can be very tempting and um, often I think hard not to do to mm. come up with a reason for why you feel that way. Right. And so I think one of the problems is people wind up spending a lot of time blaming external circumstances for their unhappiness. Mm. Whereas a lot of times there isn't even a reason. Like you're, I think emotions are a very powerful tool and I think our intuition and instinct are a very powerful tool to help us understand certain circumstances and relationships with other people and so on. But we have to sort of take them as well with a grain of salt because your perspective is not necessarily an objective one. Your perspective is most often a subjective one. And um, if you don't understand that and you can't sort of take a step back to look at the bigger picture, then I think you just sort of keep running down the same path um, without, you know, absorbing the information that you need to help you sort of weir off of that path. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say one thing where yoga did really truly help me. Like for one, the skepticism helped me a lot, sort of, you know, question my own thinking and question, um, you know, my, my feelings versus reality in a way. But um, yoga and meditation, definitely like meditation, especially helped me a lot in breath work in the sense of rerouting sort of neuro, neuro pathways. And so what happens is like when you keep having, you know, there's something that comes up, an emotion that comes up and you go to a certain reaction to that emotion. The more often, the more frequently that you do that, the stronger and stronger the neural pathways towards that um, reaction become. Mm. And I found meditation to be very helpful in the way that it allowed me to sort of, you know, if I slow my breathing down, it slows the heart rate down and it sort of helps to pause that, um, like the physical, mental feedback loop because they kind of go together. Like your body has a reaction and the brain has a reaction. It goes back and forth and it feeds into each other. And using meditation, you can sort of, um, you can become aware of your triggers or like you, you're the stimulation that sets you off, basically. You become aware of those and you can start to catch yourself a little bit earlier and earlier before mm -hmm you take off running down the old familiar path that doesn't lead to a positive um, end conclusion or experience. Mm -hmm. And so that way you can sort of, you can start to retrain your brain to have a more productive um, outcome. And I'll say one of the biggest parts of being able to have a more productive outcome um, comes along with communication and learning how to communicate clearly and that again comes kind of down to that sense of shame or our sort of desire to not want to accept help to be able to do things on our own and so then oftentimes we sort of give people a different reason for why we are the way that we are um, and we sort of expect them to just read our mind and know how to help us but oftentimes they don't, like they don't know. And so learning to communicate clearly about how you feel in the present moment and what would help you, I think that is very important as well because that allows the people that love you to help you in a more you know, productive manner. Mm. So. I think I have the very last question for this time and that's 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 the question that i asked also in our last previous talk the last question uh summary of 
conversation of the subject. You want me to summarize it? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, how do I summarize it? How about you go first and then I'll summarize okay, it after you. Great, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, I didn't even think about that, but actually it's, it's a good idea. Okay, so okay. My, my summary. Um, some from hearing everything you, you had to say and also relating it to my personal experience as best as I can. Uh, I'd like to say that it seems the myth of depression is very dangerous. The, I mean, the, the myths surrounding depression, the belief that it's just an idea or it's a choice. And I would really want to encourage myself as much as everyone else to rethink that and to be more open-minded about that, to be more curious and to consider that it's something much more serious and that we're not protected from that either, that it can happen to any of us. And if it happens to another person that the last thing we should do should be to judge. And next step would be the, uh, again, a, a thing, a phrase you said uh, that I liked a lot when you said, if you're diabetic, there's no shame in you know, taking insulin and relating that to depression. That sounds to me like a very powerful uh, perspective. And even if we look at uh, emotions in general, I, I liked a lot what you said through the conversation, but also kind of emphasized at the end the changing the relationship with our emotions or searching for some distance. I can only imagine how difficult that may should be in a, a state which is completely driven by chemistry. It's it's not just a regular emotional down, but it's 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 something else. But still on all levels to do our best to uh, Remind, remind, remember ourselves that this will pass. You know, that there's, this is not the very end state, and nothing is going to change. But there's always the next state, and uh, there's no shame in asking for help. Yes, I think um, to kind of summarize it, I think it's very important to stop people from talking about it and thinking about it as a decision making process, like a, you right. know, anything that has anything to do with the quality of your character, um, because it's not, you, you have, we have to understand that these things, I mean, they're chemical, they're, this has to do with like your neurons and atoms and like the same as any other disease affects your body. It is a change of the, uh, DNA change of the, you know, how the molecules and I'm not a neuroscientist, but how all this works inside the body. Um, that depression and mental disorder is the same thing. Um, I also think it's very important for the people that do suffer from depression to recognize that they're not powerless. Like you, you mm. might not be able to willpower yourself through it and make yourself better. Mm. But that doesn't mean that you have no say in it. That doesn't mean that you don't have to put the work in because you still have to put the work in. You still have to, you know, be willing to take the steps required to regain control over your life. Um, and then for, you know, other people, I think it's, I, and there's a, there's a, like a simple saying that I hear and I like, which goes like, um whenever in doubt choose kindness mm -hmm. and you know so giving people the benefit of kindness of caring and not judging them for mm -hmm. their struggles i think is very important yeah. but we also you know other people from the outside can't take responsibility for somebody else's well-being if they aren't willing to help themselves and so um I mean, it's a complicated issue, but I think a big part of it, you know, I think it would make a big difference to get rid of the, the shame associated with it because mm -hmm. the 
people that are suffering, they already, they're already ashamed. They don't need any extra shame. Yeah. Like it's not, that's not beneficial. Um, and, you know, I think there's also just so much to be said for human connection. And another thing I'll say is there's a lot to be said about choosing your friends well and not associating with people that are going to drag you down into the gutter. But instead, actively seeking out, you know, human beings that allow you to grow, that, you know, that inspire you to be your best self. Um, and I think it's very important to find meaning. And if you don't have, you know, your own family or children or something to give you meaning, perhaps you want to go volunteer somewhere, you know, animal shelter, work with kids. There's so much stuff. Like there's so many things in the world that we can do to give ourselves um, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. Um, and I think that is also a very important key to um, sort of breaking that cycle. So did that summarize it? <laughs> Absolutely, I think so. And and I just think in general, I like that summary at the end, but at the same time, I recognize that the talk itself and hearing what you had to say and your reflections, your insights, uh, that's already uh, plenty of uh, very good knowledge and information for people. And I, I do believe that there will be people who will listen to this and Either it will help them understand better as an outsider what's mm -hmm. happening and how can they participate and first of all, at least not to judge. But also I'm hoping that people who are going through this will have an experience to hear it because I always think that it's very powerful. Uh, and it's kind of one of the phrases I discovered for myself recently that uh, we, as a society these days, we don't like to share the negative aspects of our life. And I think that that's a terrible thing we do to each other because then we look at Facebook and it seems everybody's living a great life and I'm the only one who's having trouble. Well, reality is we all have our troubles. But I also think it's the point is also not to just go out there and complain and be a victim. And mm -hmm. the different method that I came to appreciate is uh, going through trouble, eventually coming out at the other side and then being open about it, which I think this is exactly what was spoken about today. It's, it's a much more powerful experience than just pretending everything is great or just telling everyone how things suck. <laughs> but, but instead, if you like, I, this is an easy way to kind of think about that. If you look at somebody, for example, let's say was a runner and then there's a horrible accident and they, you know, they lose their legs of course, that's like a horrible scenario. Um, but that person still has the choice to make of, is that going to be what breaks you? Are you going to allow it to rob you of your, you know, the joy in your lifetime? Or are you going to overcome the adversity? And I, th I think like the, there's, I feel like there's a lot of this victim mentality that goes around. Um, where people kind of, they, you find an excuse for being miserable and you just accept that. Mm. And then you're going to be a victim forever. Or you can acknowledge that you have suffering and that you have a struggle, but you can still, you know, you still have ways of improving your life. And depression is not something, it's not a death sentence. It is something that you can live with and you can have a you know, wonderful life. You just have to make, you know, a few adjustments and a few good decisions along the way. And my biggest pet peeve as of late has been when I see people on social media, for example, um, you know, posting about the negatives of, um, you know, medication or um, that kind of stuff because because, you know, I, for one, I understand that it doesn't come from a place of experience in most cases. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, But because there are so many people that can't help it, that really do need that help. And there's, there's a lot, um, there's, there's a lot sort of weighing on our public judgment, Mm -hmm. literally like you. And if we want to, if you want to talk about, you know, saving lives and so on, one of the leading causes for young adults, um, after, especially for young boys, like after accidents is suicide. And um, I think we can sort of make a difference there. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for two. And it's one more time. I wanted to, to thank you for this and for the talk, because again, I, I, as I said in the beginning, it's not easy to find people who wear their hearts on their sleeves. <laughs> and oh. also, you know, with addition of critical thinking and personal experience. So I, I really appreciate the, that we, we spoke about this and I always have that vision that why I do want to have this on record. I, I, have, I have plenty of appreciation for just having that conversation, but I always feel like it's great to have that on record because I do envision people listening to it and, and hearing things which they do need to hear. So I, I trust that there will be some people who will benefit from this. I hope so. And if you are listening and you are struggling, just try to remember that you can change your circumstances and time always passes. Um, and I've gotten lots of you know messages from people before about you know that they struggle as well and that they appreciate somebody coming out yeah. and saying it publicly. Um, and so I encourage, you know, anyone that feels like they need assistance to seek it out. And um, I have oftentimes in the past been quite open to, you know, talk to people if they feel like they need or if they want to come chat with me, especially if they know me. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I think it's I just think it's really important for us to maintain that connection with other human beings. Um, And, you know, it's kind of like elephants. When you get a sick elephant, they'll flank the sick elephant to help them keep going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think we can certainly um, sort of mimic that as human beings. Well, great. Thank you very much again. Um, I'll press. Yeah. Hope to help someone. I, I bet it will. And actually, the, I'll just put this la- very last bit on, on record. Uh, you know, when, when I, I, I find, I catch myself thinking that same idea, I hope this will help. I also sometimes get to bump into those situations where there is even like some video which is released and only a long time later, not even through direct means, I get to hear that it did help someone. Just nobody ever told me. But mm-hmm. I, I kind of learned to expect that, okay, it will help. You know, there's not even if I won't hear about it, somebody did hear it, so I'm I'm 100% sure it will help someone. Yay!